I've been struggling with this. I have known since Tuesday. Uh, well, we got home Monday night. We got home Monday night. So since Tuesday, I have known that um, I had to share this. God woke me up at like 2 o'clock in the morning. He was not planning. He began to speak to me. And when I got up, like I thought that I was going to be looking at one thing and God took me immediately to like all I kept hearing was um, I searched for somebody to stand in the gap and I couldn't find nobody and so I went searching for it and that's Ezekiel chapter 22 verse 30 and 31 and this is what it says I'm reading from the New King James Version it says so I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. Therefore, I have poured out my indignation on them. I have consumed them with fire, with the fire of my wrath, and I have recompensed their deeds on their own heads, says the Lord God. Um, I was very clear when I read that, um, what my responsibility was here. And that it was a responsibility to speak what thus says the Lord. I have been struggling like when God was first speaking to me what to say. Um, or making it clear to me that I needed to speak this that was being given to me. Um, one of the first things that I acknowledged is that everything that I spoke was going to be what God told me to in harmony with John chapter 12, verse 49. And this is what that says. John chapter 12, verse 49. It says, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. So I'm not sharing this or speaking any of this from my own authority. I am speaking because God woke me up and he poured into me and began to tell me and show me what to speak. Um, it says, the father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. Uh, so going back to this Ezekiel chapter 22, Ezekiel chapter 22. Again, um, God deposited it in me um, when he kept speaking to me early, early in the morning about looking for someone to stand in the gap. And the problem was he found nobody. It is not God's desire to destroy anybody. God, that's not God's desire. God loves us. The scripture says, for he so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believed might not perish but have eternal life. So it's not his desire that anyone lose their life. And that is why he was looking for someone to stand in the gap. And he said the problem was he found no one. And so because no one stood in the gap, because no one spoke the warning that if you keep in mind, there's a, a Bible book called Jonah. And in that story, Jonah was supposed to go and warn the city of Nineveh, um, which is a, a, it was a, a wicked, very wicked city. And Jonah tried to go the other way. And God stopped Jonah, disciplined Jonah, and it set Jonah back on the path so Jonah could go warn this city. So it is important and, and it is very important that we warn um, when God gives us these warnings. As a matter of fact, if you turn to the third chapter of Ezekiel, I think it's verse 17 through 21. God is speaking to the watchman and he says to the watchman, if I give you a command, if I give you a warning and you don't speak it, he says that the people will die for their sins, but you will be held accountable because you didn't warn. He says, but if I warn, if, if, if I give you a warning and you speak it and they don't listen, they will be held accountable, but you won't. won't. And if they do listen, you will have saved the soul. That was me paraphrasing. Go read it. Ezekiel chapter 3. And then it is repeated in chapter um, 33. So, uh, again, verse 30 and 31 was what God woke me with and poured into me. 
And I had shared with you already John chapter 12, verse 49, where um, it says that, that I'm not speaking of my own, um, but I am anointed, appointed by God to speak this. I have the authority of God to speak this that I'm sharing with you. And I'm going to speak what God tells me to say and what he tells me to speak. So So as I was going over this information, I ended up looking first at verses 23 and 24. And this is what it says. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, again, I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 23 and 24. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, say to her, you are a land that is not cleansed or rained on in the day of indignation. And so that was the warning. You are a land that is not clean or rained on in the day of indignation. Now, what that part means or rained on in the day of indignation, um, God is a consuming fire. And so the day of his wrath, the day of the fiery judgment of his wrath, what he's saying is those who will receive this wrath would not be rained on, excuse me, would not be rained on that. To give you a, a visual, think about in Florida, not Florida, uh, California, when they had the forest fire that was going on real bad and it was going on for days and even weeks. And the big issue was they couldn't put it out. They, they couldn't put it out at all. And it just kept burning and burning and, and there was no rain. And so what he's saying, um, he says, son of man, say to her, you are a land that is not clean, that is not cleansed or rained on in the day of indignation. In other words, he's saying not only is you not clean, but not only, but, but when I uh, can't put my judgment out on you, you won't receive no rain. You won't be, um, uh, you won't uh, uh, receive anything, any help, anything that will put this out. You know, it won't be quenched, uh, so to speak. So I knew. I knew that I needed to go back even further to understand this. The fact that God says that, that this is a city that wasn't clean. The city that is being talked about is Jerusalem. Now, the significance of Jerusalem, I don't want you to think over there in Israel across seas. I don't want you to think that because God is speaking this to his people. The, the problem that we have today is that we will hear or read God's word and we would apply it to them instead of to us. And that's where we miss it. When we read God's word and we always look at it as being something that is applied to somebody else, we miss what he's saying. And, and, and so therefore, the judgments that we experience, the things that we go through is just because we didn't listen to hear what God was speaking to us. So Jerusalem, um, this, this chapter is in reference to the sins of Jerusalem. Jerusalem represents the place of worship throughout the Old Testament. Um, the place where God, uh, God's name was, the place where God approved of worship services to himself was Jerusalem. Um, and so Jerusalem represents, whenever you read about Jerusalem, it represents the place of worship or AKA today, the church. Verses one through five. Let's read that first. And then, um, I'm going to go in and begin to speak what thus says the Lord. So. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 22, reading from the New King James Version, verses 1 through 5, it says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Now, son of man, will you judge? Will you judge the bloody city? Yes, show her all her abominations. Then say, Thus says the Lord God, The city sheds blood in her own midst that her time may come. And she makes idols within herself to defile herself. You have become guilty by the blood which you have shed and have defiled yourself with the idols which you have made. 
You have caused your days to draw near and to come to the end of your years. Therefore, I have made you a reproach to the nations and a mockery to all countries. Those near and those far from you will mock you as infamous and full of tumult. So going back, um, people like to say, you know, you can't judge me. You know, you can't judge me. Only God can judge me. But here the Lord says, now, son of man. Will you judge? Will you judge? He's, he's, and he said it twice. So he's telling us to speak. He says, yes, yes, you will judge. Show her all her abominations. And so this is what we're going to address now. The abominations of the places of worship. the places of worship, the church. We're going to address the abomination of it. Um, it says, the city sheds blood in her own midst. That represents church hurt. That represents all the people, all the denominations, all the churches where people are being hurt. They are wounded. Um, there's so many people who are leaving the church. There's so many people who don't want to have nothing to do with religion. There's so many people who don't want to have nothing to do with God. So many people who won't read the Bible because of the hurt that they, has, they have experienced within the church. It says the city sheds blood in her own midst. She's hurting her own self. This It has been said that... Um, or we have referred to the church as being the spiritual hospital. And it has been said, I have heard it said, that the church is the only place that wounds the wounded. See, a hospital, in a, in a natural hospital, when a person is sick, they can go to the hospital and get what they need so that they can be made well. They can get the medicine they need, the healing they need. They go and see the doctors and the nurses at the hospital and, and they're cared for, lovingly cared for, tenderly cared for. But in a church, which is the spiritual hospital, it's the opposite. In the church, which is a spiritual hospital, people go in wounded and they get even wounded, wounded even further. So the first abomination because here God's words say in verse number two show her all her abomination so the first thing that is mentioned in verse three thus says the Lord God it says then say thus says the Lord God the city sheds blood in her own midst so um the fact that there has been church hurt people who have been severely wounded within the church not once not twice but several times over by many different ones God saw that he sees it and he calls it an abomination something that should not happen in Jerusalem period in the church period this is not something that should be happening and he sees it and he's going to address this he's finally going to address this Um, verse three also continues and says, and which means that's not the only thing, not only is they hurting people within the church, but here's something else they do. It says she makes idols within herself to defile herself. Now, let me explain this, this to you, the idols within herself to defile herself. These idols is people who are trying to make a name for themselves people who are trying to promote themselves within the church. In the church, um, according to God's word, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Jesus Christ is the one who died for us and paid the debt for us. Jesus Christ is the one who was chosen. God said, this is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. Jesus Christ is the one whom we are supposed to be following and looking to. But people are making idols of themselves. They're making names for themselves. They're going out and they're, they're putting their own name on everything in, in, in this ministry and that ministry. And, and, and they're all about themselves. And they want this award and that award. And they're doing a lot of, let me finish reading this before I even go further. It says verse 4. 
you have become guilty by the blood which you have shed. Again, that goes back to the church hope by the people you have wounded. Because well, a person that is wounded, they shed blood. It says you have become guilty by the blood which you have shed and have defiled yourself with the idols which you have made. You have caused your days to draw near and have come to the end of your years. Therefore, I have made you a reproach to the nations, a mockery to all countries, those near and far. Those far from you will mock you as infamous and full of tumult. So full of chaos, full of drama, full of all just all time. And, and that's what we see today. We see today a lot of people don't want nothing to do with church. A lot of people hate the church. A lot of people um, mock the church. A lot of people like you say you're a Christian today and people don't even want to have nothing to do with you. They, they they really don't because because of all of her, the hypocrisy that they've seen within the church all the things that they've experienced in addition to the hurt people who are all about themselves in the church people who are doing some underhanded stuff just so that they could climb these ladders of recognition in the church and get all these awards and all of these plaques and all of this um <laughs> Y'all know what I'm saying. Yeah, y'all know what I'm saying. And and again, God's word says, this is verse four. It says, you have become guilty by the blood which you have shed and have defiled yourself with the idols which you have made. You have caused your days to draw near. In other words, your time is coming to a close. God, God was like, okay, I, I didn't gave you time. You done did all this. Now your days is coming to a close, he said. He says, I have, you have caused your days to draw near and have come to the end of your years. Therefore, I have made you a reproach to the nations and a mockery to all countries. Those near and those far from you will mock you as infamous um, and full of tumult. God is talking to Jerusalem. God is addressing the sins of Jerusalem. Jerusalem represents the place of worship. So we're talking about every church, every church, every church, every religion, every church, every religion, Jerusalem represents it all. Every denomination, every denomination, Jerusalem represents it all. And God is calling it out. He sees he has saw it, he sees it, and, and he's done with it. He's fed up with it. Now, I have um, spoken before about how the sins of the priest and the sins of the government will bring a plague on the people. Um, last year was the year of Corona. Last year was the year that the plague came through. And it's coming through again. But this year, where last year it was targeting the adults, this year the children are getting hit. I want to show y'all something real quick and then I'm going to pause and we'll come back with the next section. But I want to show you something. This is Ezekiel. And it's Ezekiel chapter... Nine. Um, in chapter eight, before I, I go into chapter nine, in chapter eight, uh, Ezekiel was in his home. He had some of the elders of Judah with him. They were praying, yada yada, and Ezekiel ended up having this vision. And um, one of the angels came and got him by the tuft of his hair and brought him to Jerusalem and moved back walls and was showing him all types of abominations. Like the people that, that were being seen. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm just going to keep paraphrasing this chapter 8. So the people who were being seen didn't even know that God was looking at them. Didn't even know that God was moving back the walls and showing them to the prophets. They didn't know. They didn't know. They thought that they was hidden. They thought that nobody saw what they were doing. And that was not the case. That they were being utterly exposed. So in chapter 9 and in, in, in chapter 8, uh, 
God kept saying to Ezekiel, do you see what they're doing? Let me take you over here. Look at what they're doing. Let me take you on this side. Look at what they doing. Let me take you over here. Look at what they doing. And and he kept showing him. He said even greater abominations you got to see. So in chapter 9, um, the next thing Ezekiel experiences is he hears. I'm going to read this. It says, then he called out in my hearing with a loud voice saying, let those who have charge over the city draw near each with a deadly weapon in his hand. Then suddenly six men came from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with his battle axe in his hand. One man among them, so now here comes the seventh, one man among them was clothed with linen and had a writer's inkhorn at his side. A writer's inkhorn, an ink pen, right? An ink pen, clothed in linen, paper, right? Because that's where, you know, the original linen was what they wrote on. And he had, so this, so there was a man that came forth with a writer's ink horn and, um, um, yeah, and linen. It says, they went in, so this man and these six with the weapons, they went in and stood beside the bronze altar. Now the glory of God, of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub where it had been to the threshold of the temple. And he called to the man clothed with linen who had a writer's ink one at his side. And the Lord said to him, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the forehead of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. To the others, which is the six that had the weapon, to the others, he said in my hearing, go after him. In other words, the man with the clothing, linen with the ink on was going to go first. And then the other six was going to follow after him. And so he said, go after him through the city and kill. Do not let your eye spare, nor have any pity. Utterly slay old and young men. Do you not see that happening with these, this plague? It says, maidens and little children and women, but do not come near anyone on whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. So he was marking them in the forehead and he said, begin at my sanctuary. So look, the church at his sanctuary, begin with the church. He says, um, so they began with the elders who were before the temple, the elders, the um, those in positions of authority, the leaders, the church leaders, the pastors. They got hit, too. They got hit, too. There was a lot of pastors that died, y'all. There was a lot of pastors that died, y'all. Don't think that just because you hold a title, that means that you're in a position that is protected. Because Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23, he said, many in that day will cry out to me and say, Lord, Lord, did we not do many powerful works in your name and cast out demons in your name and heal in your name? And and and, and Jesus said, um, get away from me. I never knew you. I never knew you. So we need to be examined. We need to get this warning. We need to not, as we read these warnings, we need to not look at it and then say what they doing and that person is doing and this person over here is doing. We need to get this warning and take this warning for ourselves. And we need to make sure that we are doing what we're supposed to be doing so that we can be found with a mark on our forehead. So when these destroying angels come through, these destroyers come through with these swords that these destroyers will pass over us i'm just saying it says um verse number six utterly slay old and young men maidens and little children and women but do not come near anyone on whom is the mark and began at my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were before the temple. With the elders who were before the temple. Then he said to them, defile the temple and fill the courts with the slain. Go out. And they went out and killed in the city. 
So it was that while they were killing them, I was left alone and I fell on my face and cried out and said, Ah, oh, Lord God, will you destroy all the remnant of Israel and pouring out your fury on Jerusalem? Then he said to me, the iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great and the land is full of bloodshed and the city full of perversity. For they say the Lord has forsaken the land and the Lord does not see. And as for me also, my eye will neither spare nor will I have pity, but I will recompense their deeds upon their own hand. Here, just then the man clothed with linen who had the inkhorn at his side reported back and said, I have done as you have commanded me. So understanding that, understanding that this very judgment is what we see happening today. Y'all call it what y'all want to call it. Y'all call it what y'all want to call it. But this is what we see happening right now. Even the children is getting hit. But God ordered that. God ordered that. And he said. The iniquity. The sin of the house of Israel and Judah. The difference between the two. Because Judah is, is like when you're talking about the nation of Israel. The tribes of Israel. Um, it's, it's 12 tribes. Judah is one of those 12 tribes. But they got in um, trouble because of Solomon's disobedience. There was a split between the tribes of the 12 tribes of Israel so that Judah is comprised of two tribes, which is Judah and Benjamin. And the other 10 are called Israel. Okay. So there is a sin that happened and you read about that in the book of Kings, from first Kings to second Kings, you read, so you have, let me, let me put this out here. God rejected Israel. Okay. He rejected them because of false worship. He rejected them. So to go around and, and try to separate yourself from everybody else. And, and you wanted to try to make yourself stand out because you know that Jesus name is Yeshua. OK, and you know that Jehovah in, in Hebrew is Yahweh. And so you want to try to separate yourself by using Hebrew language where everybody else is speaking in English. So you want to kind of set yourself apart and set yourself on this level. Um, that is incorrect. I'm just I'm just going to say that is incorrect. It is incorrect. It is incorrect. Um, it's incorrect. That's not scriptural. That's not scriptural. That's not scriptural. I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to stick with this. I'm going to stick with this and I'm going to be obedient to what God is telling me to be obedient. But that is really no different than uh, defiling yourself with idols that you've made for yourself. Idols. Because now you want to put yourself in this separated um, position and, and make it seem like, okay, everybody else is wrong. Look, all of us has been wrong. Every last one of us humans straight across the board, all of us has been wrong. And that's one of the things that Jesus was trying to show when in John chapter nine, um, he healed the blind man, the man that was born blind. He was saying basically that man represented all of us. We were all born blind. Every last one of us. And Jesus was trying to get us to see and to understand uh, that that uh, he is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the door. And anybody coming in back some other way other than King Jesus um, is a thief and a robber. I'm going to keep going. <laughs> I'm going to keep going. So uh, the first five verses of Ezekiel chapter 22 deals with Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, the places of worship, the places that have said and presented themselves as being um, uh, places of true worship, places ordained by God. And so he's sitting there and he's exposing it all. And he's saying to all of them, he's like, you're dirty. He, he says, you're dirty. You're full of blood guilt. You have been hurting people. 
church her. I see, I see what you're doing. He's telling us, I see what you're doing. You're wounding with the people are already wounded. They're already wounded and you're hurting them even worse. Jesus called the, those leaders blind guides. That's what he called them, blind guides. Um, in, in Matthew chapter 23. He says, not only are you wounding people who are already wounded, not only are you full of blood guilt because you're pushing people away from me, you're, you're hurting them worse, but you're also setting up idols. You want people to worship you. You want people to follow you. You want people to elevate you and acknowledge you. And, and some of you pay to get to where you are. We don't pause here and pick up with the next verses. Okie doke. So now we're going to pick up with verses 6 through 16. And these verses deal with the princes, um, the government. The first verses that we read, verse 1 through 5, dealt with the city of Jerusalem, the place of worship. In other words, religion, all religion. So this verse 6 through 16 deals with the government. Listen to what it says. This is Ezekiel chapter 22. It says, look, the princes of Israel, each one has used his power to shed blood in you. Now, now look, we're talking about the government. We're talking about all governments, all of them, all of them straight across the board. Think about some of the things that you read about in the news. Um, things like, for instance, I'm just going to give you a couple of examples. Um, what was that guy's name that got caught? He killed, he ended up killing himself, but it's still Weinberger or something like that. I'm probably saying his name wrong, but he, he got caught for prostituting. He did like a lot of high class prostituting and, and so like, um, Queen Elizabeth, her son, the baby boy, Prince Albert, I guess his name is, he got caught up in all of that and come to find out there was one of the young girls that, that um, uh, I guess they said was raped by him or however, like, like it's the, all governments, we not going to even begin to, I'm not going to waste no time discussing any of the dirt that has happened in the United States government that is constantly being exposed from one administration to the next, whether it is Republican, Democratic, or however, from the from the rooty to the tootie, from the top, from one end to the next, from the top to the bottom, there has just been all types of uh, stuff being exposed about different ones. Um, in government, and then even in these other countries, there's stuff that is constantly being exposed. There's coups that is happening, coups or coups, if I'm saying it right, um, coups that is happening. The Taliban just took over Afghanistan and some other places, and there's this other place, um, Malaysia, Morocco, it's something start with an M where their government got taken over. Like, it is just a lot of stuff that is going on from government to government to government to government, okay? Whether you're talking about a democratic government, which is what the United States is, or governments like over there where Queen Elizabeth is doing her, her stuff, her thing, and, and truth be told, she's not running anything. She's just a figurehead. They call it what the institution or whatever they call it because they're just figureheads while other people are doing the running and, and doing the, the lawmaking and all that other stuff. Anyway. Listen to what God's word say, because I promise you in everything that is being exposed here in Ezekiel chapter 22, verses 6 through 16, you're going to recognize everything as something you have heard in the news. So it says, again, look, the princes of Israel, each one has used his power to shed blood in you. In you, they have made light of father and mother. In your midst, they have oppressed the stranger. In you, they have mistreated the fatherless and the widow. You have despised my holy things and profaned my Sabbaths. In you are men who slander to cause bloodshed. 
in you are those who eat on the mountains. We talking about now those who eat on the mountains. We talking about those who are really, 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 really rich. Those who got bull cool money and they eating well and doing well and they sitting up high and everything. While it's a whole bunch of people, little people down low that is suffering and in can in you. Um, this is. Verse number nine, in you, there are those who eat on the mountains. In your midst, they commit lewdness. In you, men uncover their father's nakedness. In you, they violate women who are set apart during their impurity. One commits abomination with his neighbor's wife. Another lewdly defiles his daughter-in-law. And another in you violates his sister, his father's daughter in you they take bribes to shed blood you take usury and increase you have made profit from your neighbors by extortion and have forgotten me says the lord behold therefore i beat my fist at the dishonest profit which you have made and at the bloodshed which has been in your midst can your heart endure or can your hands remain strong in the days when I shall deal with you? I, the Lord, have spoken and will do it. I will scatter you among the nations, disperse you throughout the countries and remove your filthiness completely from you. You shall defile yourself in the sight of the nations then you shall know that I am the Lord. Listen, listen, I'm about to read what I have underlined in these notes. I have, um, this is a study Bible. And one of the things that I like about this Bible, we see how big it is, but one of the things I like about this Bible is the intensive study notes. So I'm about to, read what I have underlined. It says, where do I want to start? Verse 6. The princes are specifically indicted because it was their responsibility to make sure justice was administered in the community, especially by protecting the poor and the weak. That's the purpose of the government. And the governments ain't been doing that. The governments has been taking advantage. It says the lack of concern for the disadvantage was a clear violation of the Mosaic Covenant. It says um, about slander, because it mentioned about slander in verse 9. It says, in you are men who slander to cause bloodshed. It says slander is associated with bloodshed, lewdness denotes unchastity the reference to the father's nakedness men means his other wife or their stepmother um the fact that god has said about them that they've forgotten him um it was another way of saying that they have rejected god's covenant uh how far did i go i went to verse number 16. it says the residents of jerusalem will be scattered all over the world if they continue to pursue disobedience the residents of jerusalem will be scattered all over the world if they continue to pursue disobedience it says um, moses had warned israel that continual national disobedience will lead to dispersion just as precious metals are melted down to remove dross israel will be purified by fire to remove sins and impurities um the babylonians would execute this fire in God's wrath, of God's wrath, when they burned and sacked Jerusalem. The Babylonians represent government, and um, again, Jerusalem represents place of worship. So it's talking about uh, Babylon being used to execute the fire of God's wrath against Jerusalem. In other words, to shut it down. God said, Can your heart endure? Now, check this out. When you're going through something 
and you feel like you're getting hit from every which way, every angle, every side. When you feel like like just people just coming at you just constantly, constantly, and you want to lash out and you want to snap back and clap back and all that other good great stuff. You want to do all that and, and you don't understand why why you getting hit. God's word says, this is verse number 14. Can your heart endure? Can your hands remain strong in the days when I shall deal with you? God say he's the one dealing with you. You fussing about all this, that, and the other that is happening to you. All this, that, and the other that is coming up against you. You getting hit from every single angle, every single side. Just stuff coming back to back to back to back to back. God said, can your hearts endure? Can your hands remain strong in the days when I shall deal with you? God said that he's the one that's doing it. Let me um interject something real here. Um, a thought here. I'm gonna go over to Second Chronicles chapter. So I want to show y'all how to how to get through that when you feel when you're experiencing that and you feel like you're just getting hit from every angle and you just don't you don't have the energy to stand. You just don't know. You just can't take another. I wanna I wanna show you. How to get through that. Because again, I want to emphasize to you that all of this stuff was happening because of the wickedness of the prince of the government and and of the places of worship. The places of worship first and then the government. It was because of their wickedness. God said that I will bring your reproach upon your own head. Your dirt is on your own head. He said in verse 23 Say to her, you are a land that is not clean or rained on in the day of indignation. So he's warning, right? And he's telling us what to look for. But when he says that, when he says, can your heart endure? And if you have been through some stuff and you feel like you're going through some stuff and you're getting hit in every angle, angle and all you can sit there and think and say is it hurts. It hurts. Let me tell you how to deal with this. This is 2 Chronicles chapter 7. I'm going to start at verse number uh, 12 actually normally I started verse 13 but I'm starting verse 12 and I'm gonna read from verse 12 to verse 15 maybe verse 16 17 we'll see so it says and this is second chronicles chapter 7 starting at verse 12 then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice when I shut up the heaven and there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send a pestilence among my people. If my people who are called by my name, now he's talking about his own people. He ain't talking about the world. He's talking about the Christians. He's talking about his own people. He said, if my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then, now he said, you got to humble yourself, pray, seek his face and turn from your wicked ways. He says, then if you do all those things, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. If you humble yourself, number one, that was the first thing you got to humble yourself. If you humble yourself, if you pray, if you seek God's face, look to him for the answer, seek his face. And if you turn from your wicked ways, he says, then I will hear from heaven, forgive your sin and heal your land. He says in verse 15, now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever. And my eyes and my heart 
will be there perpetually. As for you, if you walk before me as your father David walked and do according to all that I have commanded you, and if you keep my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom. And as I covenanted with David, your father saying, you shall not fail to have a man as a ruler in Israel. But if you turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments, which I have set before you and go after and go and serve other gods and worship them. Then I will uproot them from my land, and I, which I have given them, and this house, which I have sanctified for my name, I will cast out of my sight, and will make it a proverb and a byword among all peoples. And as for this house, which is exalted, everyone who passes by it will be astonished and say, why has the Lord did this to, to, did thus to this land and this house. Then they will answer. Because they forsook the Lord God of their fathers. Who brought them out of the land of Egypt. And embraced other gods. And worshipped them and served them. Therefore he has brought all this calamity on them. It is so plain. It is so plain. And if you didn't understand it with me reading it, go get your Bible and sit down and look at this and get this in you because God is warning us. And especially now, look, y'all, the children are, are the children are suffering now. The children are dying now. Those six men with the, the, the swords, they coming through. That scripture is being fulfilled right now. That was Ezekiel chapter 9. I read that earlier. That is being fulfilled right now. And ain't no mercy, ain't no pity being shown. There is look, God is no respecter of persons. So when you see this stuff happening, you need to do what Daniel, I mean what Ezekiel did, and what Ezekiel did when he saw that stuff happening in Ezekiel 9, he dropped to his knees, which is humbling yourself. You drop down to your knees, you pray, he prayed, he sought God's face, he asked God, will you? destroy all of them in your wrath like like and 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 God answered God answered he told Ezekiel why it was happening he told us what to look for and he told us what to do if we humble ourselves if we pray if we seek his face and if we turn from our wicked way, which means that we can't be worrying about what the next person is doing. We can't be saying, well, this one did this. Why are you talking to me? This one did this and that one did that. We, we ain't got time for that. It ain't no, look, it ain't no time for that because God is dealing with everybody and he would deal with us too. So we need to humble ourselves. Um, the next verses is verse 17 through 22 and we're going to pause before going into those verses okay we are doing good we're getting through ezekiel chapter 22 the first five verses we looked at the places of worship, uh, Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, which represents the place of worship as a whole. And we saw God's judgment against them in reference to church hurts and his reference in reference to how they try to different ones try to make a name for themselves in the church as opposed to lifting up King Jesus. They try to elevate themselves. And, and um, then we looked at verses six through 16 which dealt with the government and oh my gosh it was like list after list after list after list of the things that are being done in the government and we see that today go back and read it we're now getting ready to deal with verses 17 through 22 verses 17 through 22 and i'm going to read it first it says the word of the Lord came to me saying son of man the house of Israel has become dross to me they are all bronze tin iron and lead in the midst of a furnace they have become dross for 
from silver. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have all become dross. Therefore, behold, I will gather you into the midst of of Jerusalem as men gather silver, bronze, lead, iron, um, and tin into the midst of the furnace to blow fire on it, to melt it. So I will gather you in my anger and in my fury, and I will leave you there and melt you. Yes, I will gather you and blow on you with the fire of my wrath, and you shall be melted in its midst as silver is melted in the midst of a furnace so shall you be melted in its midst then you shall know that i the lord have poured out my fury on you let's discuss this this is going to be interesting so god used a lot of um picturesque words he talks about israel now when he talks about israel he's talking about his people as a whole, Israel, all of the nations, um, Israel and Judah, the 12 tribes. He's talking about his people as a whole. And he said they all are dross to him. What does that mean? Well, dross represents something that is regarded as worthless. It represents garbage, rubbish, something that you cast out. And so he was saying about Israel, that all of you are rubbish to me. All of you are. He says they are all bronze, tin, iron, and lead. So let's look at that. Bronze. Now, did you know that in the United Kingdom, the word bronze is a slang word used to describe a dishonest police officer? So bronze has to do with um, human nature and uh, it has to do with dishonesty. Dishonesty. Tin represents being tone deaf. Tin. So not only are you dishonest, not only are you a bunch of liars, but also, ooh, let me write that down. <laughs> liars. Okay, so he's saying not only are you bronze, you're a bunch of liars, you're dishonest, but also you tone deaf. You don't listen. Write that down. Don't listen. You deaf. You can't hear. You're tone deaf. You don't listen. That's 10. He called them iron. Iron is strong will. He say you stubborn. Yeah, I'm writing my notes. I'm writing my notes. He said, you are stubborn. You are rebellious. You are strong. So he called his people worthless, garbage, a bunch of rush, a rubbish. And what do you do with garbage? You cast it out. You get rid of it. You throw it away. Why did he call them that? He said that they were a bunch of liars, that they were tone deaf, meaning they don't listen. They were strong will, stubborn, rebellious. Um, and the next thing was lead. Lead has to do with positions and authority. Uh, you want all these positions and authority. Uh, what else does lead have to do? I think I'm going to have to look up some more on lead. <laughs> Dig a little deeper into that. It says, in the midst of a furnace, um, they have become dross from silver, the gar garbage from silver. Now, now, what is silver? Silver, on the other hand, represents age. It represents uh, qualities of purity, clarity, vision. Um, it symbolizes subtle strength. Uh, it's very versatile, yet malleable. Um, meaning, meaning it's moldable, it's shapeable. Silver can withstand abuse, uh, weathering, and even heat. So dross from silver is the garbage, all that gook, that yuck that comes off of the silver as the silver is going through the fire to be cleansed and purified. So he says, the house of Israel has become dross to me, garbage. They are all bronze, liars, tin, uh, tone deaf, they don't listen, iron, they're strong will, stubborn, and lead, or lead, and lead. Like they they want to take the lead. They want to have these positions of authority. They, they want to rule 
over people. It says, um, in the midst of the furnace, I have, uh, they have become dross from silver. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have all become dross, garbage, therefore, behold, I will gather you into the midst of Jerusalem, the place of worship. Now, check this out. I'm going to mention this again. I don't remember which holiday it is. I think that it is around the Easter holiday that people celebrate uh, Easter. I think it's around that holiday when they talk about Jesus riding on the back of a donkey into uh, Jerusalem. I think it's there or maybe it's the Christmas holiday. I don't know. But the significance on Jesus riding on the back of the donkey in through the gates into the city of Jerusalem. The significance of that is that donkeys are stubborn. They are stubborn. Oh my gosh. So the fact that Jesus rode the back of a donkey shows that, that he, he rode it. In other words, he drove it into Jerusalem. Like he, he made it go. They were stubborn. They wanted to do their own thing, but he made it go in through the gates into Jerusalem. And so here it says... Behold, you have all become dross, garbage. Therefore, behold, I will gather you into the midst of Jerusalem. So he's causing everybody to come into Jerusalem. It says, as men gather silver, um, or as they gather uh, strength, bronze, as men gather silver, bronze, iron, lead, and tin into the midst of a furnace. Now he's talking about, at this point, they're talking about literal silver, bronze, iron, lead, and tin into the midst of a furnace to blow fire on it, to melt it. In other words, to melt it means to humble it. So he's talking about a humbling that's getting ready to happen. It says, so I will gather you in my anger and in my fury, and I will leave you there and melt you. That goes back to what I read earlier where he said um, in verse 24, where he says that you, you'll be rained. Um, it says you are a land that is not cleansed or rained on in the day of indignation. In other words, he said, I'm going to gather you into this. You're going to go through this, and I'm not even going to give you no relief. You're not going to get no rain. Um, it says, yes, I will gather you and blow on you with the fire of my wrath and you shall be melted in its midst. As silver is melted in the midst of a furnace, so shall you be melted in its midst. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have poured out my fury on you. Interesting stuff. Listen, I'm tried as if by fire. Proven to be gold, I'm going to stand for you no matter what life brings me to. That reminds me of what Jesus had said to Peter when he said to Peter, listen, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but um, I have prayed that uh, your faith not give out. In other words, Jesus said that that this is going to happen. Satan's going to do that. But as this is happening, he's not praying for us to not go through. He's praying that our faith is able to endure and that we're able to come out on the other side of it. That's why we need to be building ourselves up now on our most holy faith. That's why we need to be learning to trust God now. That's why we need to be reading God's word now. That's why we need to be getting it in us now because we are all, every last one of us, God said, all Israel, every last one was dross. All of us have to go through that process. It's a process. And one of the things Jesus recently said to me was trust the process. We all have to go through it. And some are so stubborn that they're going to have to be forced through this thing. But but the whole purpose, the end result is that, um, that uh, we learn from it. We learn obedience to things, suffer that we begin to give our lives to the Lord, that we understand, that we begin to understand that he's trying to save us, not destroy us. He said, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you, not harm you, to give you a future and a hope. He said, your eyes haven't seen, your ears haven't heard, neither has it come up into your thoughts, the great things I have for you. God has a plan for us and it's a plan for our good, not for our bad. Um, we're going to pause here. 
before we go into this last part of Ezekiel chapter 22. Y'all doing good. One more part to go. Oh, you know, this is the last part of it. It is verses 23 through 31. And actually, this is where everything started for me so that I knew that I knew that I had to go through this and share these verses with you. So I'm going to read it and then we're going to discuss it. Ezekiel chapter 22 verses, starting at verse 23 and reading down to verse 31, it says, And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, say to her, you are a land that is not cleansed or rained on in the day of indignation. The conspiracy of her prophets in her midst is like a roaring lion tearing the prey. They have devoured people. They have taken treasure and precious things. They have made many widows in her midst. Her priests have violated my law and profaned my holy things. They have not distinguished between the holy and unholy, nor have they made known the difference between the unclean and the clean. And they have hidden their eyes from my Sabbaths so that I am profaned among them. Her princes in her midst are like wolves, tearing the prey to shed blood, to destroy people, and to get dishonest gain. Her prophets plastered them with untempered mortar, seeing false visions and divining lies for them, saying, Thus says the Lord God, when the Lord has not spoken. The people of the land have used oppressions, committed robbery, mistreated the poor and needy, they have wrongfully oppressed the stranger. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it. But I found no one. Therefore, I have poured out my indignation on them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath and I have recompense on them. Their deeds on their own heads, says the Lord God. Okay, so this is the last section in here. He's like recapping everything. He deals with the church first, the prophets, and then the priests. Then he deals with the government, the, the princes or the government leaders, and then the prophets who be lying to them. Then he deals with the people. So of the prophets, he says their land, um, he says conspiracy, uh, the conspiracy of the prophets is like a roaring lion tearing the prey. They've devoured people. They've taken treasure and precious things. In other words, you got a whole bunch of prophets out there that be talking about, you know, pay me, put my cash out up there and everything, you know. And I tell you what this says, Lord, baby, bad, baby, bad. God uh, is not happy with that. It says that um, the conspiracy of the prophets in the midst is like a roaring lion tearing the prey. They've devoured people. They've taken treasure and precious things and have made widows in her midst. It says of the priests, it says that uh, they violated the law, profaned as holy things. Um, they have not distinguished between the holy and the unholy. In other words, they've been a bunch of compromisers. Um, they have not made known the difference between the unclean and the clean. They have not been teaching God's word, not correctly. Um, they have uh, hidden their eyes from the Sabbath so that I am profaned among them. The princes now, these are the government leaders. And again, regarding the princes, they were supposed to protect the people. Um, that's the first function of government being the establishment of justice for everyone that was supposed to protect the people. And of course they didn't do that. It says regarding the, the princes, um, they're like wolves tearing the prey to shed blood, to destroy people and to get dishonest gains. So uh, without even going into detail, y'all see what's going on in the news and um, everything that has been exposed, exposed about leaders, those who have had, positions of leadership, regardless of whether it was over the 50, the 10, the um, 100, the 200, they, they have been uh, very dishonest with what they 
uh, been doing. It says her prophets plastered them with untempered mortar. In other words, the prophets, those um, church ministers, leaders, teachers or whatever that be gathering around these um, political authorities and supposed to be advisors to them, spiritual advisors to them. Y'all been lying. God said so. It said he said. Um, her prophets plastered them, talking about the princes, with untempered mortar, seeing false visions and divining lies for them, saying, thus says the Lord God, when the Lord has spoken nothing, God called y'all a bunch of liars. Those of you who consider yourself to be advisors to these political officials, God called you a liar. His word says it, Ezekiel chapter 22 chapter 22 verse number 28 god said it it says the people of the land now 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 you went from dealing with the the church the prophets and the priests in the church to dealing with the government the princes and the prophets in the government and now you're dealing with the people it says the people of the land use oppression they're very oppressive um, they want to rule it over one another and, and lord it over one another they commit robbery they mistreat the poor and the needy. Um, they have wrongfully oppressed the stranger. And so God said, I see all of this. I see it all. I see everything. I see it from the from the church to the government to the people. I see everything that's being done. And so this is what he said. So I sought for a man among them, just one person among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before for me on their behalf. In other words, he will stand like Moses did and said, Lord, no, don't do for your name's sake. Don't destroy the people. He said, I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the people of the land that I should not destroy it. But I found no one. Therefore, I have poured out my indignation on them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. I have recompensed their deeds on their own heads, says the Lord. He was looking for somebody to stand in the gap. He was looking for somebody to warn them and to tell the people what to do. Humble yourself. Pray. Seek God's face, which means the seeker answer from the Lord. Let the Lord direct you and tell you which way to go and turn around from your wicked way. He was looking for somebody that would stand in the gap, that would pray to God. Please, Lord God, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. While at the same token, telling the person, humble yourself, get them, hit them knees now and begin to pray to God now. Um, he was looking for a person to do that. And he said, because he could not find one, not one, because he couldn't find one. He says that um, I have poured out, therefore I have poured out my indignation on them. And that's what we're experiencing. This plague that is going through and still going through. It went through last year and killed up a whole bunch of people. And now it's still going through. And this time it's getting children too. Come on, y'all. That's Ezekiel 9. All day long, that's Ezekiel 9. God said that I have poured out my indignation on them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. I have recompensed their deeds on their own heads, says the Lord. So, um, yeah, I am standing in the gap. By warning, there was another little piece. Uh, I think I did a video on it. If I still get the video on my phone, I will attach it to this. I'm about to get this together and get this posted. And I pray that it reaches as many hearts and that the heart of the people will begin to understand what God is saying in this word as they hear it. And that they will take that opportunity that they have now. Because every day that God wakes us up is another opportunity for us to humble ourselves, to pray, to seek his face, and to turn around, to get ourselves right with the Lord. He said, I gave them time. I gave them space to repent, but they didn't do it. He's desiring and wanting for us to repent so that he can heal us. Will you repent? 
kind of go. Bye.